So welcome everyone. Um, what we're going to do is look at early Schlachtschwert. And I'd like to first do a bit of a, the talky bits in the beginning, because there is a bit of a, um, I'd like to explain first um, how you're going to approach something like this. Because the problem with early Schlachtschwert is that we have no explicit sources about it. There's a lot of things you can use to try and find out uh, about this, this subject, but there's no source that says uh, this is the fight book on the use of the Biedenhander um, from around 1515 or something. So you have to be a bit creative in your approach. And what we're going to do today is therefore like a bit of a combination between something of a lecture and an actual workshop. So what I'd like to do is I've been, been working on this subject for you know, a year, two years roughly now, and basically present the state of the research, and then you also get to actively participate in this sort of lecture by doing the things that uh, I think uh, early Schlachtschwert looks like. Now, I think that I've managed to come up to some principles that you want to apply here. And I'm not going to tell you them until the very end of the workshop. So it's also going to be a bit of like the kind of class that I teach in high school. First, we give all the examples, and then you as the students need to deduce all the principles from it. And then at the end, we check whether everyone understood the class. Um, now, let's talk about that methodology a little bit. So there's no actual explicit sources, but there's a lot of other source material that you can kind of use. And this is uh, what's often called embodied knowledge. So what happens is that fencing books are not fencing, right? We can all agree on that. So a fencing book is not actually fencing. Fencing is fencing. So if you want to learn fencing, you have to do it. You can't just read the book. You have to go and do it. And there's a lot of sources like the uh, MS327A, sometimes known as the Dubinger Codex, that literally say that. So practice is better than art and then you combine your practice with art. So fencing, um, yeah, a fencing book is just a, a description of a fencing art put down on paper. Now embodied knowledge is kind of like an approach that says like, hey, you start learning a certain embodied skill, something that you can only truly know by doing it, and then you try and get some information from that. So, and that's kind of cool because you can use that to uh, find out if there's a relation between several sources that are not uh, textually or iconographer through iconography linked to each other. So, for instance, you can say like, hey, there's a certain art of messer fencing in southern Germany, and you have a bunch of different fight books like um, uh, Codex Wallenstein and Leckuchner that try and write it down in different ways. They, the fight books are not related, but they describe the same art. And you can uh, apply that approach um, in a different way as well. You can try and reconstruct a fencing art uh, if there's no explicit sources from other stuff. So you can create certain data points. So for instance, a Schlachtschwert, where was it mostly used? It's in the name. Exactly, in a battle, in war. So you can start looking at like what were people wearing in war. So you can start looking at images of Doppelschildner who have units like this, so a Schlachtschwert. Um, how do these things look? So you can start looking at originals. You start gathering some data about them. Uh, you have something which is on the very lighter end of the spectrum, or you had absolute units like the one that uh, Ulrich's making. Um, you can start looking like, hey, what is one of these Landsknecht uh, wearing? So you find out, hey, they're wearing armor most of the time. So anything you're going to be able to do with these things has to be compatible with wearing armor. Uh, otherwise, it would make very little sense. There are fight books that describe the use of two-handed weapons around the time when these things came into fashion on battlefields. So you start looking at these fight books, and you create all these data points, and at some point, these overlap. And it's that overlap where we're going to be operating in today. And I think I've been talking quite a lot now. Um, have I been explaining it well so far? OK, very good. So we're going to be operating in that overlap. And this is where basically where the practical bit of the workshop starts going. So for getting ourselves ready to play with these great swords, we all have a great sword. We're going to just go through some basic mechanics first. Uh, then we have a couple of partner techniques that come from fight books that um, basically fulfill the criteria of working in armor, making sense uh, against, for instance, a pole arm as well as an other sword, and such things. And at the end, we're going to play a little bit, see how you could theoretically build your system out of this. 
So that's basically the general idea. We have about an hour and a quarter for it, so we don't have to rush it particularly much. We can take our time, but um, it's not like a full-length workshop, as you might be expecting, so it's a bit shorter than normal. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to go and first do some solo mechanics. I'm going to be walking around and, and helping people uh, out with that. And those solo mechanics, um, they start off with making some simple cuts. And we're going to start with a little bit of figueredo because, uh, as the guys were previously explaining, uh, all those Iberian and Italian sources are very similar. The German ones are not much different. So by tapping into something that you may already know, we're going to um, go from there. So what I'd just like to do is go over basically what I think Figueredo's rule number one simple should be like, which is basically just making cuts from below. So what we're just going to do um, as a bit of a warm-up for uh, the fencing mind, as it were, just making these cuts from below. So either from position over here or position over here, it doesn't really matter that much. Long edge cut from below, like so, into this position, and then short edge cut, like so. And just work with that a little bit. You can basically do this stepping forward twice, stepping backward twice, so you don't take up too much space, something like that. Uh, does this make sense, or would you like me to explain the mechanics of this a little bit more? Or is this a good starting point? Good starting point, yeah? Right hand and back with the left yes. No, no, yeah, you can do that. It doesn't really matter. You can step forward with right, forward with left, backward, right, backward, left, or you can indeed, as you say, that's uh, a yeah, guy. Um, cut, cut through and not uh, stop at the point. To... You can do both. You can do it fluently, like so, or stop at the point, like so. That's basically, I'll leave that up to you, both are valid. But you should be able to stop with the point. So even if you're flowing through, you should be able to stop, yes. Yeah, but you don't, of course, end up here, but next to the head. I've been looking around a bit at what people are doing. There's a variation of different interpretations of Figueredo, as it should, this is right and proper. Um, <clears throat> but there's one thing I'd like you to pay a little bit of attention to for this workshop in particular. So if we make the cut from below, from the right side, indeed with long edge, so keeping the arms open like so, from the left I'd like you to work with short edge because that also keeps the arms open. So you want to avoid basically crossing your arms like this on the left side. So not like so, but rather like so. So pay a little bit of attention to that. The other thing is uh, we need to share half the hole, so don't go over that half. Um, so a little bit less space between you, just to make sure that the other workshop also has space. Right, continue. Very good. Uh, let's take another of, of Figueredo's simple rules as another starting point. Now making cuts from above. So again, from this position over here, where, um, anywhere where you'd like. We're going to do rule two simple, so we're basically going to um, cut from above into a position where the hilt is in front of your head and a point forward, like so. This is a nice position because it allows you to pretty much make a second cut. So the end position for the first cut is going to be this like ox-like position, a hilt in front of the head, point forward. The end point for the second cut is going to be basically sword next to the head on roughly around your right shoulder. Um, basically make yourself comfortable with this one, just for a couple of minutes. It should be quite straightforward. You've probably done this a hundred times uh, before, but just for me to check whether we're doing that, um, to have a nice similar baseline. So find yourself a spot, go try this. Right, so this is going well. Uh, basic mechanics, but at least we're all at the same baseline now, so that's good. Uh, and this is where we're going to introduce some of that weird German stuff that may turn out to be very similar to Iberian and Italian sources. Uh, for this, I started looking at uh, Duder's fight book. And Duder has this weird section on the sword. And I have uh, Jan to think for uh, pointing out that this could actually point to a Schlachtschwert. Uh, wouldn't be weird. Um, Duder wrote that thing around 1515 in Nuremberg. 
we have actual references of these being made in Nuremberg around the time. We see them in paintings. So when they talk about Gänge, so rounds with the Das Schwert, it could be this. It could also just be longsword, or it could be longsword as a training to use this. We don't know. But you can take that fight book <coughs> and take snippets from it and make it work with a greatsword. Now, that text is notoriously vague, so you can find wildly differing interpretations that all fit the text. Um, this is just an interpretation uh, that I found that I liked that works well if you're doing this um, with a battle sword, something with a very long hilt, uh, and potentially in armor. So what we're going to do is basically this. We're basically going to start from any position, and you, you can either do some sort of a ready position. Let's not do that one, actually. The organization doesn't like that, so let's just start next to the shoulder. Normally, it would be like throw it upwards into a position so that it, the point stands backward. So getting yourself into a ready position. And this gang, this round, basically describes us doing the following. It's basically a combination of just the previous few things that we did, and that one's kind of cool. So what we're going to do is pretty much make a free cut from below, Unterhau, into this position, stop it here, rotate it over our head, and then cast a blow. So for Streich here, and step with it. So pretty much what we're going to do is very similar to what we just did in the workshop before, incidentally. So from here, free cut from below, until we're in this position, but we're not stepping. Rotate it over the head, so that we're again with the sword above, and then make a cast blow. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna step with it and end with it on our left shoulder. So that's another end position. We can end here or just here. Now you'll find that if you have a very heavy sword and you really let it go, you wanna cut through something or someone, uh, <clears throat> This one will allow you to be still very nimble with it, but the things that you will see over there or some of the heavier uh, great swords we have in this group, they'll want to keep going. And that's where that secondary back position comes in, because once we do this and we really go for it, you end with the great sword on your left shoulder. This is also a position that you find in a lot of images, a Landsknecht fighting a skeleton, uh, fighting death or a landscape fighting a guy with uh, Kriegsmesser. So that kind of position. So you really, even if the sword is three kilos or even heavier, you want to be able to make this cut and still stop it here. And that's what I think what he means when he says, bring it to your left shoulder. So that's just one half of this gang, but we're gonna practice that first. So cut up bring it back over the head, really big thrown strike into a balanced position. You may find that you may even need to bring your balance to your back leg in order to basically take the momentum out of this strike. Uh, what I'd like you to do for this is pair up. One of you is going to do this, the other one is going to be a bit of a coach, so it's going to observe, seeing if there's perhaps some pointers, some cues that you can give the other person. You're going to try a couple of repetitions, then the coach says, nice, tweak that, do a couple of repetitions more, switch around. Does that make sense? Right. Find a partner, go try that. Okay, let's add the other side to it. So we've just managed to make a front cut. We're going to in that backward weighted position, probably. So we've just done this. What we're going to do now is basically the reverse. So now you're going to do that short edge cut over here. And we're going to end up again in that position where the sword is over our head. And again, a thrown cut to the other side, again with a step. And now you're going to, again, have that backward weighted position, getting that thing over your shoulder, almost as if the point is gegen den Mann. So against your imaginary opponent. So again, if you make a really hard cut, if you throw that, if you cast that blow, quite strongly. So this one, yeah, easy, but if you cast that blow strongly, you want to at least have the ability to dampen, uh, take out the momentum a little bit like so. So let's add that. I'm going to show that from the other orientation. So we've already had the first part. Cut. Cast the blow. 
and then whoop. Like so. Kind of similar to what we did in the previous workshop, but hey, that's a fun point to make actually. So let's go practice that. Uh, any questions about this at this point? Yes. I'll do the other direction now. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, very good. Wait. Yeah. Question. Uh, yeah. The blow from the left side, uh, is it an undercut with a short edge? It's an undercut with a short edge, yes. So again, you want to have your arms open a little bit. So, yeah, so ideally, you do not cross your hands over all that much. And that is quite significant, because imagine trying to, to do this if you're wearing arm plates, or, God forbid, you have one of these globular breastplates that are very great at protecting you from sharp, pointy things impaling you, but crossing your hands in front of you becomes more difficult. And yeah, there's always people who say, like, well, in my armor, I can cross my hands in front of you. Probably not while swinging a great sword at full force. Um, so you want to keep your arms open. And I think that's why this is a slightly nicer way of doing that. So arms open, therefore short edge cut from that side. Very good. So uh, same partner group, now the complete uh, sequence. We have a bunch of building bricks now. I'm going to add one to it. And this is where things get weird a little bit. I'm not really sure if you'll find this in Iberian or Italian sources, but German fight books like their short edge stuff, and they like covering this line in like many different ways. So at some point, Duder says, make a flugelhau. And then you have two options to uh, make a flugelhau. You either have the Poudenfeind one and um, the Kölner Fechtbuch one. Um, the Poudenfeind one is kind of cool. It's very much. Uh, you cut at someone over here, uh, you cut at someone over here, and then you cut them straight for the head. Kind of cool, but there's a lot of arm crossing in there. Um, and doing that with a sword that weighs three kilos doesn't feel very attractive. Uh, however, the Kölner one is kind of cool. Basically, what the Kölner one says, tells you to do is this, bam, and then go low. So this is something that I found you can do in armor very well at speed um, with a quite heavy sword. So. What happens here is that he basically tells you to cut the flugel into a shield. And that shield, mm, I've interpreted it as this position because it covers you. It can be used as a shield against things, as we'll find later on. So what happens is that he tells you to, again, go into a position so that the sword stands out behind you or backwards. And then from there to cut a flugel. So what I'd like to do is basically just turn in as if I'm going to make a shiller. Uh, so don't step until I'm actually in position. And then make this cut over here. Now, this is nice. And then the second part is kind of cool. It tells you to step around, turn around as it were, and make a thrown cut. So again, cast a blow. And again, be in the shield. So you're kind of combining a, sh a shiller with Figueredo's rule too simple. It's pretty fancy. It's a bit weird, but I liked it. I tried it in armor. It can kind of work. Uh, how to make it work, mostly, is before you <coughs> make this so-called flugelhau, turn into it first, and then just cut like so. So it's a very gentle, short edge cut into this position. If you're gonna wanna go and cut all the way before you've turned into the position, then it becomes weird. You start slapping people with the flat. That's not nice. Turning first, stepping after, works. Rebalance yourself, cast the blow, and be in that same shield position on the other side. Let me show that again from another orientation, slowly. We're here, we're turning, we're throwing this flugelhau into the shield turn around, cast the blow, back into a shield. Just one possible interpretation of this uh, gang, uh, but it's the one that's pretty fun. It gets this nice little short edge cut over there, but you find in some other sources. You have some multi-directionality because it allows you to turn around quickly. So fun for the whole family. Go try that. So one more time. 
from any position next to your head. It can be this, it can be this, which is more according to the fight book. Cut, cut, like so. Uh, find a new partner group, so new coach, student groups, and go try this. So this is where we're gonna introduce some partner techniques. Uh, and this is where to go, go to Andre Poudenfeind. Poudenfeind has uh, a longsword section, and in that longsword section, the swords look really weird in the 15, uh, 16 um, printed edition. The swords have relatively short blades, relatively long handles. And what I found when looking at Poudenfeind's staff and his master section, it then he tends to take the simplest common denominator for techniques and then builds on that. So eliminate everything that could be complicated if you're doing it under duress, uh, and then just stick with the things that will have a very high success percentage. And with the sword, again, uh, you have a couple of things that would actually very well work with armor, or on a battlefield, um, when things need to be simple and quick. So here's a couple of things that you can do from those uh, cuts and positions that we've been going through so far. So we have them do doing a little bit of deuter. Now you can combine that with powder and find if someone cuts at you. And the nice thing is uh, these things work quite nicely as well if, for instance, you swap out someone cutting with a sword for someone uh, cutting with a halberd or um, having some other type of weapon. So especially the one we're going to do now is quite suitable for that. It's basically just a hanging parry with a sidestep which will allow you to use that against um, not just other swords, but uh, even against, um, as Bonafide says, boar spears or uh, halberds, I suppose. So what we're going to do is we're going to approach someone, and we're going to make a little bit of a stück, a play, as it were. So what we're going to do is I'm here. My partner is also in a hochort, so high point, high guard. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically try and get this uh, flugel to land on them, but then they're going to take a step back. So I'm going to go up, whoop, flugel, take a step back. And now we're in the position where Pound and Find describes the hanging door play. So at this point, you could make a cut uh, at me from above and make a thrown cut like so that could theoretically go through, we're not going to do that today, into this one. If you do that, that's gonna end badly. It, it will look something like the Turk and Sook with Messer, and that one is more than capable of slicing someone's arm off. I'm pretty sure if you do this at speed with one of these, it's not gonna end well. So we're just gonna stop it in front of their head. Um, with this sword, it's quite well balanced. That's easy. I'm the instructor, I get to make it easy for myself. So, whoop, oof. I can stop this here. However, if you've got a bit of a heavier blade, that stopping is going to have to occur a little bit sooner. So you have to be very careful that from this point on, as soon as there's contact, you're going to start having to stop. And I believe that you can cut through. Totally believe it. But you have to kind of stop in front. You don't want to actually land on the face. If you land on the face by accident, that's fine. That's why we wear masks. But you're going to have to stop a little bit sooner than that, just for safety. We all know what it feels like to really make that cut through. We can imagine it, we're not gonna actually do it. Uh, let's show it again from the other side. We're gonna do our little deuter thing. Whoop. Like so. Any questions about this? Okay, yeah. Uh, I tend to go with diagonal because if I go vertical, I can. Um, then you go into Altibajo territory. Um, I find that more difficult to control. Um, you can do it. Uh, what I tend to find is I like it better slightly diagonal. So, whoop. Here, and then I stop it here. That's why it looks a bit weird. But you will have to imagine I pull it through into this when actually cutting through someone's face like that. Question answered? Uh, 60 degrees or 45? Uh, 60. 45 is very flat trajectory, uh, usually. Uh, you might have to if you have a very long blade, because when you have a long blade, that's going to hit the ground if it's 60 degrees. Uh, adapt based on your weapon. Yes. Any other good questions? Any bad questions? No? Okay. So, go find a partner, go try this. So, I've been having a look at how this is going, uh, looking very good. Um, so, it, I think it makes sense. Right? So, you can use this differently as well. 
So one of the things that another really nice stück from Palm Find is Kronhau. Um, and it basically goes like this. So again, just like with the previous one, we have all these positions, Hochort, that's very similar to what you find in Duder. Um, and you go through the shields and some of the um, cast blows that we've had before. Um, so they are very much describing a similar way of fighting, I think. What we're going to do now is just we're not going to actually bait out an opponent. We're just going to cut at them and continue the barrage. We're going to keep working in there, so to speak. Very German. Don't let up uh, until you keep hitting them, which is something you tend to find in German fencing sources. So what we tend to do is we're going to try and cut at partner, and they're going to take a step back and parry. Just like that. Seems fine. Now what I'm going to do is basically raise it up and go into my shield, as it were. Again, that kind of like flugel howl kind of movement, very short cut. You can do that either with a step if you need to, or you might even reach the face without that step. Now, of course, uh, Martin, you got that thing coming towards your face. What do you want to do? That's a good one, in which case that, but we're going to work with a slightly different parry now. So we're going to go to that side. So as the power, please don't hit me in the face parry, which is nice because I can do this Whoop. again. So it's a very similar combination of cuts that we're going to do, but we're going to do that when in blade contact with an opponent. And Bottom Find shows this with um, sword, but I do think that once you somehow have bound on a polearm, something very similar happens. Something uh, similar could happen to, for instance, Figueredo's uh, Rule 14 composite, where or is that, I think it's the composite one, where you basically beat down and then go here with the thrust. Could be that cut as well. Uh, so it's a very similar thing. If this were a pole arm, you might not actually cut at them at first at the shaft, but the principle remains the same. So we cut, make that short edge cut, and cut them through the head once they open up. Let's show it again from the other side. Approach. Cut, short edge cut, whether it hits or no, in the material, and then cut them for the face. Does that make sense? Okay, want to go try it? Yeah, I can do it again. I'll take the orientation over here now. So, cut once, cut twice, and cut three times. Basically, a combination of the things that we've been doing before. But rather than just immediately going for the flugelhau, first cut into a bind, raise it up, and then do that. And then the rest is basically the same as we did before. The cone how without the step? Uh, depends on distance, right? Uh, in this example, you can do it without a step, because that's what we have been doing for the most. If your partner starts walking back a lot, you want to do that. So if you walk back a lot more than you've been doing up till now, if you walk back now, this makes no sense. I'm losing initiative, so then I go... And then I can still cut here, um, may end up clipping the hands, or I may end up missing the guy completely, and then we have to reset. But that's not bad, right? So if necessary, you need to step after the Kronhau. Yeah. For the purpose of the exercise, your partner's staying a little bit close, so not running all the way backward. Good. All right. Partner up, find a new partner, go try it. Thank you. Now, as I've already been talking about, like a lot of this is um, done with the idea in mind that you are going to be wearing armor while using this. Now, one of the things, one of the places where you would find such battle swords in actual battles was either um, grouped around uh, the Hauptmann and other high um, officials like Fendrix or uh, the Banners. Uh, but you'd occasionally also have a line of halberds and or greatswords in the third or fourth rank. You see both of them attested in early sources. Uh, and what we found is that once pikes actually get stuck um, and you have enough spacing between the pikemen for them to normally naturally fight well, as you also see in sources like that, uh, it's, it actually works very well to just send in the heavy hitters. So the pikes get stuck. The pikes are not really doing anything anymore. Uh, at that point, you can just send in some breaching squads of people with these things. Now, if you let these loose among uh, pikemen who've just lost control of their main weapon, they might have some katzbargers around. 
it's going to be absolute carnage. Uh, but front rankers, um, especially in uh, early Landskrieg days, will always be very properly armored. So they will have a proper breastplate, uh, pretty decent helmet, and most likely arm plates as well. So you're gonna have to be able to do something against armor, potentially. And Powder Fight obliges. He has a couple of things where you transition from just Blosfechten into something that you can use as a Kampfstück, so something that could be used in armor. I think is what the meaning for that is. So what we tend to have is, for instance, uh, we have someone who's going to cut at us from above, making a big swing. So either we uh, go very unlucky, we ran into the opposing battle sword user, someone with a halberd maybe, or someone who's making a really big cut with a Kassbalger, doesn't really matter. Um, we're in a position where we kind of want to block that. So what we have done is uh, we're going to start in this one over here and we want to block that thing at all costs. Now, what you can do is a very nice block like so. And that's going, basically going over the opponent. So what we're going to do, either from a position like this, or even if you're a bit back-weighted, basically just bring the sword over your head as the attack comes at you, stepping into it, and then go here into half sword, where you can go for the face, which is usually open, maybe into the throat guard from below, or even uh, try and find the arm plates, especially if someone doesn't have these nice rolled edges, you might find your way in there. Um, those, usually the infantryman's arm plates also don't fully cover, so you have some space in the arms. And then it's just a matter of a lot of violence to get the job done. So um, it will look something like this. I'm gonna go a bit slow, but we go here, I block this cut, maybe go for the face once, go for the arm another time, face again, etc. We don't have to do all that, but you can imagine a couple of sharp stabs, a lot of shanking, and then on to the next person. So we're gonna practice that a couple of times. So, and that's gonna lead on to other cool stuff down the line. So again, from here, bah, and then step into it to land the point in front of the face. There's a lot of different other positions how you can get there. Uh, there's even, um, we don't really go through thrusts because that's even more conjecture, so I'm leaving them out of the thing today. But theoretically, you could make a thrust that you load up in front of your chest and then grab like so. We're just gonna go for the easy one because I wanna go to the cool throw that comes after us. So, uh, for starters, let's reverse indeed. Just your basic position. Oh no, big cut, pull arm or big sword. And here. What I want you to focus on is when blocking, please do not grip your blade already. You're gonna grip your blade tight once you have the opponent's blade or shaft or whatever is coming at you secure. If you're gonna block it like here, eh, this might happen. Bad news. So if your hand happens to be in the path of this blade, if you have your hand open, you're still kinda good. And you can step around and still get it. Yep. Right, find a new partner, go try this. Couple of minutes, then we go to the variation straight away. Thank you. So this wouldn't be a workshop of mine if I wouldn't somehow manage to get some Messer and Lecrisner in here. Uh, but I think it will count because this, this is also stuff that uh, Powder Fine is talking about. But using Messer sources, you can expand on this, find variations. Uh, basically the same idea. So we have the thing that we've done before. Uh, if I already I saw a couple people playing with other things, like for instance from this position here, then going to half sword, completely going over it. Um, now, when this happens, probably you're thinking like, get that point out of my face, right? Yeah, I still have the point in the face. And now the point in the face on the other side. So this is a very nice little thing that you can do. And what basically happens is from this position, if someone tries to put the, basically uh, your point away, is that you're just gonna change through underneath and stab them on the same line on the other side of the blade. Now the nice thing is you can try parry again. Try parry again. You can do very nasty stuff. So you can do follow-ups like so. So what happens is we're just gonna go through the entire thing. Block. Go here, someone tries to set it aside, up, whoop. And either hit them with the pommel or step behind <laughs> for a throw. 
Right. Uh, I'll show that again from the other side. And I'm going to focus a little bit on that movement there. Boom. Here. This is basically it. So keeping your right hand in place, basically, you're just lowering your left hand underneath. If it clips your fingers a little bit, uh, that's going to happen. You're going to have some finger guards, while um, in a historical context, you're going to have some arm plates, and that's not going to matter particularly much. Uh, for now, you might want to wear some light gloves just to make sure it doesn't clip your fingers in an uncomfortable way. So, whoop, just let the point slip underneath, point slip underneath. You can raise the rear hand a little bit if you want to create more space, uh, but the, the main dipping comes from your left hand. Now, if someone starts to really commit to pushing aside, you can go over, either hit with a grip, uh, cross or pommel, or step through for that throw. Um, ideally, you do this once, twice, three times, and then throw. And then see how you end up. It's ultimately this movement and then seeing what that does to your partner and seeing how you can throw them from there. Uh, don't sweat the execution particularly much. Most of us will know how to do a back lever throw. This is, however, not a floor on which is nice to fall on. So just go to the point where you could throw someone, but then don't drop them. Yeah? Any questions? Go play a little bit with this nastiness. So we're very much coming up towards the end of the workshop. Um, um, what I'd like to do is still chat a little bit about how you can uh, take these data points that we've been going through and build that into a system. So I basically like to bring things together and ask you the question like, hey, uh, are there any sort of principles that you may have deduced from what we have been doing? Things that you keep in mind if you maybe take this home and expand on the work that I've been doing and spread it around, as it were. So any principles that you may have found? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the stuff is supposed to work with armor, so every motion where you have to cross your arms is probably, probably not that good. Yeah, exactly. So if you assume that you're going to be a heavily armored person, or at least going to have infantry armor on, uh, you're going to have arm plates, crossing arms, I've tried it. It wasn't a very pleasant experience. Um, so you want to indeed keep the arms open as much as you can. So all the positions that we went through, this one, open arms. Here, arms open. This cut, arms mostly open. This cut, mostly open. This keeps the arms mostly open. So they're supposed to work with nice nimble blades like this, but also heavy ones, and you shouldn't be impeded by any armor that you're wearing while doing so. Very good, that's a nice principle. Gotcha, any other things that might have struck people? There's a lot of weak against strong. It's a lot of weak against strong. So yeah, you tend to not really engage other weapons all that much. Do you have an idea what that might be? Uh, momentum of the initial impact of the heavy swords. Yes, exactly. So a lot of the things that you'd find in Goliath, for instance, wouldn't work that well in the battlefield situation because they're very much about um, leverage um, and power generation forward doesn't really work that well if you're wearing armor, doesn't really work that well in battle situations. There's another reason why you're mostly working with uh, weak responses against strong things. Because uh, you, what we did then now is we've tried to go against a weapon that's either as big and heavy as ours or heavier. Imagine someone striking at you with a halberd. You're not going to defeat that with a strong thing unless you really go for a big block like this. And then still, there is a deflection in it. You're not going to push it like so, that was a very good point to make. You wanna have a slight deflection so that it goes off to the side. So again, it needs to work against heavy weapons. Yeah, uh, as, such as halberds. So you need to have practiced something with a sword and then go like, hey, but I could use this against a halberd as well if I apply those same principles, yes. Something else that people may have found. Very true. Now, that is more of a function of the fact that uh, the sources that I wanted to use, so I wanted to stick to some sources, uh, don't necessarily show thrust. You can use them, and I like them uh, as well. But that's just something that, because I wanted to keep it a little bit source-based, fell outside of the scope of the workshop. They can be deflected quite easily. Yes. If 
you're not working in half sorting. Exactly. So if you're fighting people in armor, those thrusts don't work that well. So I do think you have a good point. So what you find in a lot of Iberian sources is uh, that thrusts are great for situations where you need someone to clear off. Um, tanking thrusts while wearing half armor is actually quite easy. We've done it a lot. Uh, at some point, you're going to go like, ah, oh, that person is thrusting me, but I don't have to worry about it because uh, I've got a stop rib on my harness and it's going to be fine. So, yeah, uh, you need to be very careful about those thrusts. Indeed, good one. Um, and another thing I'd like to point out is that a lot of the stuff, um, and we didn't get to cover that, that would have been maybe an entire workshop on its own, but a lot of the stuff that you find in Durer um, shows you how to do these mechanics in multi multiple directions. So one of the things that you have, which is kind of cool, uh, this one is mechanically very difficult, uh, but it's kind of cool to take home, so we can show that, for instance, is what happens if, for instance, uh, someone cuts at me and I parry it. So he has a couple of brüche, so blocks, that he shows. And what I do now is basically go into this cut and step here. And this is something I found works very well, for instance, against a polearm. So you basically uh, sidestep a polearm, block it, or engage a polearm first, and then close the distance. Huh? It's the same idea to the interpretation of Yeah, exactly. So, for instance, let's pretend it's a pike. So, <laughs> hold the point forward. Yes, very much so. So, basically what happens is I block it here, go here, and then I can keep going and reach the uh, person holding the weapon, for instance. But there's another thing. I can also do this. and then change the direction with the things that we've been already doing. So Duda also allows you to do stuff in different directions. So combine what we did with the workshop earlier with some of the mechanics that we've been doing here is absolutely possible. So a couple of basic principles. Just to reiterate, uh, don't cross your arms because you're wearing armor. Um, mostly weak responses against strong actions because it needs to be able to work against a multitude of different weapons that you're going to encounter. Uh, thrusts, maybe not, because your opponent might be armored. Go for half-sorting actions instead. And finally, you got the ability to go through a bunch of guards, basic ones or more backward-weighted ones that also allow you to change sides, which is kind of cool. So, uh, do you have any questions at the end of this workshop that you want to ask me about this weird conspiracy theory of mine? <laughs> If there's no questions right now, that's perfectly fine. Then I'm going to assume I uh, explain everything in, the, in a clear and concise manner. However, I'm pretty sure there will be questions down the line once everything's sunk in. Come find me. Uh, let's discuss things. Or if you want to come discuss uh, Goliath with me, just find me during the weekend. I'd be more than happy to. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for uh, helping me demonstrate and filming. And have fun with the rest of the event.